take it. Um, so chapter 16, section 5 through 10, and then chapter 17, sections 1 through 3 are all on the exam. Uh, all acid-base chemistry, as you're aware. And there's a lot of different types of problems. Uh, strong acids, weak acids, weak bases, titrations, buffers, salts. So being able to identify the type of problem that you're working with is uh, one of the harder things, but it's also the most important thing to do in order to be able to solve these problems. So we'll go through the topics, and then um, I have a couple things I want to talk about, some of the things that showed up on the, one of the practice exams, maybe both of them. Uh, and then we can do another titration kind of problem, and we'll go from there. So on your exam, uh, strong acids and bases. So make sure you are able to recognize the strong acids and bases. That's going to help you figure out a lot of different things. Um, calculating pH for a strong acid or a base is much easier than for a weak acid or a base. Uh, sometimes we add a strong acid or a strong base to uh, the weak base or weak acid in order to make a buffer. Okay, so be, be able to recognize those. And we know that when we have strong acids and bases, um, reactions go to completion if they're reacting with a weak acid or a weak base, or, them, or, or reacting with, if a strong, a strong acid reacts with a strong base, it, that reaction occurs to completion as well. So in those cases, we use the single reaction arrow. Uh, you may have to use a reaction table or a BCA table in order to solve a problem with that. Okay. Um, so yeah, make sure you're able to uh, calculate the pH or the pOH of those types of strong acid, strong base solutions. <clears throat> um, the next section we talked about were weak acids. Uh, so make sure you can calculate um, pHs of solutions or pOHs of solutions that contain a weak acid. And in these solutions, um, we have equilibrium. You'll see the equilibrium arrows uh, for these reactions. And because of that, we need to use ice tables in many cases to figure out concentrations of H plus or OH minus then to calculate the pH. And, all, and involved with that is using um, acid ionization constants, KAs. Okay. Um, one nice clue, if you have a, what looks like a weak acid and you're not 100% sure, if it has a KA, it's not a strong acid, I'll tell you that. Okay. So strong acids don't have um, KAs. We talked about percent ionization. Sorry. Uh, so um, make sure you're able to calculate percent ionization. Note trends with percent ionization. I think there were practice problems with that. Um, and then be able to recognize and understand calculations involving polyprotic acids. So these are our diprotic acids and our triprotic acids. And I guess within here I want to just briefly re have you recall H2SO4. This is sort of a special diprotic acid where the first deprotonation to form HSO4 minus, that is a strong acid. Okay, so that reaction occurs to completion. The reverse reaction doesn't occur. And then HSO4 minus has equilibrium um, with its uh, conjugate base, eight, or excuse me, SO4 two minus, and then H plus. So that's sort of a special acid. Okay. Weak bases, very similar types of things. Um, we talked about uh, recognizing some of the weak bases. Um, you know those like NH3 or uh, CH3, NH2, those are some common weak bases. 
the conjugate, conjugate bases of weak acids. Okay. So, questions on this type of material. So our strong acids, strong bases, weak acids, weak bases. Okay. Uh, as we continued, we then looked at acid ionization and base ionization constants Ka and Kb and noted the relationship between them. And that is that Ka times Kb equals Kw, and our Kw is the 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Um, you know, assuming at 25 degrees Celsius, which is going to be a safe bet. Okay. Uh, I don't think we're going to ask you any problems that are outside of 25 degrees Celsius. But recall that, that this works only for acid base, conjugate acid base pairs. Right? So, for example, NH3 and NH4 plus, or a weak acid HA and A minus has to be conjugate acid base pairs, Ka and Kb for those. Um, this, this conversion between Ka and Kb became very, very important when we looked at salt solutions. I know you did a lab on that a couple, uh, was it last week? Um, when you <laughs> predicted whether a salt solution would be acidic, basic, or neutral. Okay. That's something we want to make sure that you are able to do. So recognize a salt, take, a, take it apart, look at its ions, and predict how those ions are going to react in, with water if they're going to make a solution acidic, basic, or don't react at all, and you are left with a neutral solution. That's sort of the um, concept, more conceptual part, no math involved with that, but then we do want you to actually be able to calculate the pH of those salt solutions, and that's where Ka and Kb and ice tables come in. Okay. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about uh, chemical structure and the strengths, uh, strength of an acid, strengths of acids, relatively speaking. Um, so we talked about electronegativity, how that plays a role, how bond strength plays a role. Okay, so make sure you're familiar with those trends. Okay. Questions on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. how the uh, having many oxygens around the central atom works. Oh, the carboxylic acid. So the, the molecules with organic structures, we're going to skip over that. Um, so if, there, if you saw something like this and it had a bunch of other carbons and I think there was, I don't know, there might have been something like that. Yeah. For now, just we didn't talk about it. It's not going to be on the exam. Don't worry about that problem. But for something like um, uh, HClO4, HClO3, HClO2, and HClO, okay, make sure you can look at that trend and understand how that trend is going to work as we increase the electronegative atoms, the oxygen atoms around the chlorine, um, we increase the acid strength, and in fact this is listed as a strong acid, okay? And then we also looked down a group in the periodic table, um, so comparing like HClO3, HBrO3, and then, uh, yeah, we did HiO3. Okay, so make sure you're able to think about those uh, bond strengths and, and how that works. Yes? Uh, yeah, so these, um, 
So if we look at the structure, let's do HClO3, something like that. I didn't draw the Lewis structure right, but, but these are terminal because there's nothing bonded to them. Um, other questions? Okay, so then we really start to compile all of the information we learned in chapter 16 and apply it to even more advanced topics. Um, the first section in, this, in the text is uh, common ion effect, which we only talked about really briefly because uh, the practical application of that is in buffers, and we're actually going to come back to common ion effect um, in a little bit here, um, next chapter, or no, continuing in chapter 17, but in any case, um, common ion, uh, make sure you can recognize what that is. Essentially, it is an ion that shows up on both the reactant side and the product side of an equilibrium, and it, it affects the equilibrium. Okay, it changes, um, can change the pH. In, these, in this case, we're talking about pH, so it's gonna, you're going to see an effect on the pH of the solution um, because it's shifting the equilibrium, and that goes back to Le Chatelier's principle. Okay. But when we, we looked at buffers, um, so if we have an, a weak acid buffer, this is sort of a great description of, that's when I hit this, okay, sorry. Uh, that's awful, sorry. Okay. There we go. That should be better. Okay, so a common ion, essentially, if we would have some moles per liter of HA and some moles per liter of A minus in solution. And by definition, a buffer contains both a weak acid and its conjugate base in solution. And there's a number of different ways that we can arrive at a solution that contains both of those things. Um, and so that I want you to be aware of. We can physically take weak acid, conjugate base, combine them together. We can take a weak acid add strong base to it to create the weak base, the conjugate base. That's what happens in the titration. Okay. Um, so be able to recognize solutions that are buffers. And then calculating the pH of a buffer solution, this is where we use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, HH. Okay. Buffers are the only place where Henderson-Hasselbalch equation works. Right, so if you have just a weak acid in solution, you will not be able to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to calculate its pH correctly. Right. Um, okay, so then uh, the next sort of thing we did here was we thought about what would happen if we added either a strong acid or a strong base to a buffer. What is the reaction that takes place? Okay. So for instance, if we added strong base uh, to this buffer solution, that strong base would react with the HA and uh, form water and A minus. Okay. And then perhaps one of the harder problems that we do uh, this semester is calculating the pH after of a buffer after a strong acid or strong base it has been added. Okay. So you need to use a reaction table or BCA table to determine the moles of, of buffer components after the reaction takes place and then use Henderson-Hasselbalch to calculate the pH. Okay. I'm going to pause here. Questions about buffers? Okay. All right, so then titrations, right? The culmination of everything we've learned because there's four different types of problems in a single buffer or single titration. Um, we talked, in, at least in the video, of making a titration curve. If we do 
a weak acid titrated with a strong base. Um, we'll end up with a titration curve that might look something like that. Okay, pH on the y-axis, volume of base added on the x-axis. And we talked about the four different points along the titration curve where calculations are sort of unique. Um, so we have uh, before any base has been added, we have a weak acid in solution. Okay, and so that is a weak acid problem. Go back to chapter 16, and we use an ice table to calculate the pH um, of our weak acid. Okay. Skip ahead here to the equivalence point. Okay. It's important to know where the equivalence point is along your titration curve if you're working on a titration problem. Um, and that is the equivalence point is the volume at which you've added or you've completely reacted any of the weak acid away. Now you're only left with conjugate base in solution. So now you have a conjugate, or a conjugate base problem, a weak base problem. Okay. But you need to know moles, you need to go, know concentration. So keeping track of volumes becomes really important. Okay. Between those points, we have our buffer region. And you can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation in here, but you will need to figure out moles of acid, moles of conjugate base, okay, then their concentrations in order to be able to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch. And then our last point is after the equivalence point, we have excess uh, strong base, OH minus, and so the pH is going to be strictly dependent on the amount of excess hydroxide, the concentration of excess hydroxide. Okay. Except for the weak acid at the very beginning, this sort of this first point, um, every one of those problems requires some kind of reaction table, requires a reaction table. And then from there, you can use those moles to figure out concentrations and then use it either the Henderson Hasselbalch an ice table, or figure out concentration of OH minus left over. Okay. So much involved in a titration, so hard to summarize it without launching into several lectures. Yes? Yeah. You have to use both. So um, the question is, well, is it, uh, confirming that buffer, the buffer region is region two um, from the video, yes, that is correct. And uh, then the question is, do you have to, can you use either reaction table or Henderson-Hasselbalch, or do you have to use both? And you have to use both, because the reaction table allows you to figure out moles. Once you have moles, you can figure out concentration of HA and A minus. But you don't have that necessarily until you've done that reaction table. Does that make sense? Other questions? Okay. All right. There's a couple of things that showed up on the practice that are good things that I didn't necessarily talk about in class, but I, it, that are important for you to know for the exam. Um, and the num uh, one thing is picking an indicator. Do you all did titra a titration in lab this week, right? Did you use the phenolphthalein indicator? No? Did you use a pH meter? You didn't use any indicators. Huh, interesting. Okay. Okay, so in your lab, you actually then, using a pH meter, determine the equivalence point for a titration. So you created a titration curve. Um, you figured out where the sharpest point was along that titration curve, the inflection point. Got a volume and, and things like that. There's another way of doing a titration that involves the equivalence point. Oh, wait, did you 
that, or sorry, that involves an indicator. Did you do indicator titrations in semester one? Color change? Yes. Okay. Some of you are saying yes. We'll take that as a yes for sure. So in that case, you typically see when we do a titration in undergrad, you usually use the phenolphthalein indicator. Um, phenolphthalein indicators change color as bases added to the solution. So along our titration curve, let's say we've got, um, in this case, we have a weak acid, it looks like, yes, and we're titrating with some sort of, some sodium hydroxide, all right? And before we get to, I'm going to use an indicator, it's called the endpoint, not that I'm being pedantic, but um, before that it is a clear colorless solution, okay, which is what this figure is trying to represent. At a particular pH, that indicator goes from being colorless to being pink. This is our phenolphthalein indicator. That color change occurs between 8.3 and 10, pH 10. So this phenolphthalein indicator is really nice for a weak acid titrated with a strong base because that color change takes place in uh, the basic region of a titration curve, I guess. Um, there are, so this would be a great indicator. It's changing color at that inflection point. Okay? The way to choose an, an indicator is that you want it to change at the inflection point on the titration curve. This is not a good indicator. This is methyl red for this titration. Inflection point occurs at about pH 9. This methyl red indicator goes from an uh, orange color to a yellow color at about uh, between pH 4.2 and 6. So if you did that titration, you would still get a you would still get the color change, but it would happen somewhere here along your titration curve, and you haven't reached the equivalence point yet, okay? So you want this color change to happen around the equivalence point, right? Take a look at that section if that's, um, if you haven't done that yet, and if that's still confusing. Um, this figure is super helpful. There's lots of figures, lots of colors in this section of the textbook, so it's not that terrible to read. Um, but yeah, know how to choose an indicator, okay? Yes? Yeah, you might be given the pH range, you might be given, there's a table in the book um, and it has like a bunch of different indicators, their color changes and where those occur, um, but it's not numerical, it's actually like, kind of more like this, it, it shows the range in color, so it's kind of pretty. You don't have to memorize the indicators, no, 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 do not memorize indicators, okay, but be able to use that table or a table to predict um, a good indicator. Other questions? Okay. But there's a, all right, so there's one other thing that uh, I saw on your practice exam that I didn't cover, but is like a great exam question. And we'll, if you're going to take the MCAT, we'll definitely show up on the MCAT. Okay. Um, okay, so one of the uh, interesting things uh, that we can get from a titration curve of a weak acid with a strong base, or a weak base with a strong acid, whatever, uh, is the okay. This is like a simple, seemingly hard, but actually simple problem, and that's why it shows on the math, uh, shows up on the MCAT, um, because we can get the pKa from a titration curve. Um, relatively easily if we know the volume that's required to reach the equivalence point. And we know one other piece of information, that is the volume at halfway to the equivalence point. I'm going to show you why that is here, or I'm going to show you what that looks like on the curve and then I'm going to show you uh, using chemical equations why that is the case. <coughs> 
So in this figure, we have pH on our y-axis, volume of sodium hydroxide added on X. And these are four or five different, four different weak acids, one strong acid titrated with a strong base. Okay. Notice, number one, notice that the equivalence point for every single one of these monoprotic weak acids occurs at the same volume, right? So if we find the inflection point for every one of those, they all occur at 50 milliliters. So what that is telling you, this is the reaction that's taking place. HA, acid, weak acid for most of these, weak acid plus hydroxide reacts to form H2O and A minus. And that occurs to completion. The relationship here that we need to understand is that these are stoichiometric equivalents. So no matter what the acid is, if you start with the same concentration of that acid, the end point, the equivalence point, is the same. The equivalence volume is the same. Okay. It does not depend on the identity of the acid. All right. Halfway then to that equivalence point. Okay, so I'm going to draw a line here. 25 mils. So let's, okay, we start with um, 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar acid, and we're titrating with 0.1 molar um, sodium hydroxide. I'm going to rewrite my reaction. Our, our before moles are our initial moles of HA. Take our volume, 0.05 liters, times the molarity, 0.1. So 0 0.005, right? Is that right? Did I do that right? moles, okay? If we add 25 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, we effectively add 0 0.0025 moles, right? If we subtract that from the reactant side and add that to the product side, we'll get the same number of moles of HA as we have of A minus in solution. Everyone okay with that? So now we, yeah. Because this is a special point. I want to show you what, uh, this is a special point along the titration curve, this halfway point. Um, and this is going to let, it, let us get the pKa of the acid very easily. Okay. And I'm going to show you why next. So we have a buffer, right? We have both HA and A minus in solution. We're in the buffer region of our titration curve, which means we can use pH equals pKa plus log of A minus over HA, right? We've done our reaction table. We found that we have equal number of moles of HA and A minus. If we know the pKa, or sorry, if we uh, skip what I just said, we know that A minus is equal to HA, and when we have uh, we divide by our total volume. It's going to be 75 mils. You can verify that later. We have a fraction with the same uh, value in the numerator and the denominator. So we have one. 
right? This fraction is 1. When we, when we take the log of that value, that goes to 0, okay? Which means then, at that point, the pH is equal to the pKa. Okay. If we go back to our titration curve, we can determine the pKa at a particular halfway point. Okay, so we go our 25 mils, we figure out where that is on the titration curve, we can find the pH. And that is equal to the pKa. Okay. This is a special point along the titration curve where you can figure out the pKa of an acid just by knowing, um, just by looking at the pH. You can't do that anywhere else along the titration curve. And the reason being, whoops, and the reason being is that halfway to the equivalence point, we have equal moles of HA and A minus in solution, which makes our Log of, log of 1, which means that pH equals pKa. Yes? Um, it wouldn't be a range. Uh, so if we gave you a question like this on the exam, uh, we would, we would acknowledge that it is, there is some interpretation, so we would make sure that it was easy to figure out. Either it would be a multiple choice or a broad range within the uh, acceptance values on the input. So, yeah. Yes? So. Um, no, uh, no it, doesn't, it doesn't work for strong acid, strong base, um, because there's no Ka for the strong acid. So. Well, okay, it, this point is true. You would still end up with same moles, same number of moles of strong acid and strong base in solution. Um, but it's, it's, a different, it's a different thing. Yeah. Is that value for A minus 0.025 or 75? Uh, 75. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, that's a 7. Yeah. Yes. Say that one more time. The, does, the question is, does it work for KB and POH? The answer is yes. So if we started with a base, um, you would be able to get the, you would have pH equals pKa, still at the same, the same thing. Um, but keep in mind, we're only giving you this equation for Henderson Hasselbach. So um, we're going to only speak in terms of determining pKa and not pKb directly, but yes. Uh, did I see another hand? Okay. Other questions? Anything else? How are we feeling about this exam? Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard one this semester. Um, historically, this has been, third exam is the hardest midterm, so. Historic. Uh, it is usually the lowest scoring midterm of the, three, of the four. I don't I don't actually know the number. Yeah.
that uh, question, I'll go ahead and do this. So uh, yeah, I almost always show weak acid titration curves. So we started with a weak acid, we titrate with a strong base. Um, but we can most certainly titrate a weak base with a strong acid. And all of the, the same stuff still applies, OK? So you know, along our titration curve, before we add any strong acid, so here we're going to have weak base in solution. We're going to titrate with strong acid. Before we add any strong acid, <coughs> excuse me, we have a weak base. So that's a weak base problem. Okay. After we add some HCl, we enter into the buffer region, just like we do before. You still use a reaction table to figure out moles of weak base and conjugate acid. And then you can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to solve for pH. Um, equivalence point. So now we've converted all of our weak base into conjugate acid. And we're going to show here in a second why the pH is less than 7 at the equivalence point. And then beyond the equivalence point, the pH is dependent on the excess uh, strong acid that has been added. OK, so if we take um, a base, weak base, we'll call it B, and we have it in solution. Okay, it's going to have this equilibrium, B plus H2O, in equilibrium, equilibrium with HB plus and OH minus. So when we add strong acid to this solution, the base is going to react with the strong acid, going to react completely, reaction arrow, to form HB plus and H2O. Okay. So as we add HCl, that HCl we're going to mark as H3O plus, okay? All the HCl dissociates form H3O plus. That is going to react with our base to form the conjugate acid and water, okay? At some point, we've added, um, we've reached the equivalence point. So the moles of H3O plus added <coughs> equals the starting moles of B. Okay. I choose these words really carefully because when I want to make sure that it's completely reacted at the equivalence point, we completely reacted that base away, there's no base left in solution. Okay. We've added an equal number of moles that we started with a base uh, of HCl. And so at that point, all we have left is H B plus in solution. And so the equilibrium that matters at that point is HB plus plus H2O in equilibrium with B and H3O plus. And just like we do when we predict the pH of a solution of a salt, we look at what we have on the product side. We see that we have H3O plus, so we have acid left. Because of that, that solution is going to be acidic. Okay. So at the equivalence point, we've completely reacted all of the B, all of the base. It's formed HB plus. Now we have to consider this equilibrium, and so we're left with an acidic solution. So this, is, this equation is why we end up with um, an acidic pH at the equivalence point. Okay. Questions on that? Yes. This B, 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, no. So we are not going to say that this will react in an appreciable way, in any meaningful way, with any additionally added acid. There's always going to be that equilibrium, um, even if we've like added as much acid as we could imagine. Technically, there is a little bit of B left, in which could then react like this, but it's so small in comparison. So it does not matter. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, if we are asked about the buffer region for a weak base titrated with a strong acid, uh, does the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation change? So I'll say it this way. There is a Henderson-Hasselbalch equation that, you, that is sort of base focused, where it uses the pH equals pKb plus um, the base ions. We're not going to give you that, and it, you don't need it, OK? So you can still solve pH equals pKa plus log A minus over HA for a weak base titrated with a strong acid. There's a couple of things to note. Um, if you're given the Kb, you need to calculate the pKa from that. So do Kw equals Ka times Kb, and then do minus the log of the Kb, or minus the log of the Ka to get pKa. And because we're sort of used to seeing A minus over HA, we need to sort of uh, realign what that means in terms of a base. And so this is always going to be the base form, and this is always going to be the acid form. And the reason you can recognize that is that in the denominator, we have a species with one more proton. Okay? So whether that's A minus over HA or B over BH plus, Okay, that's always going to be the same. Right? And sometimes I, th I think if you would look up Henderson Hasselbalch on the uh, internet, you would see base over acid instead of A minus over HA. Good question. Anything else? All right. All right, I have one more weak base uh, titration problem. Would you all like to try this one? I'll have you do that. Take a couple minutes and then we'll solve it. So when you plug in, so when, when you change the Hennis path block to be PKB, Mm -hmm. And you do base or acid, does it plug out POH? Uh, no, I can't remember, honestly. I never use it. Um, you can go through and derive it using mm -hmm. an ice table. Um, so would we, would we just actually just do the same thing? Yeah, just use that. Same. But we just use base and acid? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, this is this A minus and base are the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, because minus if, if yes. HA is actually... Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
All right, I'm going to uh, start working through this. This is, this, is, um, this is a bit of a problem. Yeah. These are, hard, these are hard problems. I ask similar questions to my students in my um, quantitative analysis course, and they are doing equilibrium to an even greater extent than you are, and they'll still struggle with these. So I want you to know that I know that you are doing hard things. Um, so good work. Keep it up. Uh, and let's, let's try to solve this one. So uh, we're going to calculate the pH at the equivalence point. Uh, so that's something to recognize um, when we have, uh, when we add point, or sorry, when 0.2 molar ammonia is titrated with 0.15 molar HBr. Okay, so HBr is our strong acid. We're given Kb for the ammonia. And our first thing to figure out is the volume required to reach the equivalence point. I should also tell you that this is multi-steps, OK? Um, and we're not going to ask you a question with so many parts in it in, on the exam, but each of these parts is totally legit, all right? You could see one of these parts um, in the exam. So the first thing to figure out is the volume required to reach the equivalence point. And so uh, we need to write out our reaction that's going to take place when we add the strong acid uh, to the ammonia. OK. I've been really sloppy with my phases today. But that's all right. Um, so we're using a reaction table. We need to use moles. We're starting with uh, 100 milliliters of 0.2 molar NH3, or 0.1 liters times 0.2 moles per liter, which gives us 0.02 moles. Okay, at the equivalence point, we know that we've added the same number of moles of the titrant, H3O plus in this case, as we started with of the base. So I'm going to write in there 0.02. Okay? We know that that has to happen. That is the definition of the equivalence point. Um, and we're starting, we have a B, or before, we're starting with uh, zero moles of NH4 plus. So we're going to subtract 0.02 moles from the reactants and add it to the NH4 plus. So then what we find is that we have 0.02 moles of NH4 plus um, required to, or formed at the equivalence point. Okay. So then to actually figure out the volume required to reach the equivalence point, sorry, I kind of jumped ahead with my reaction table, um, we're going to take our initial concentration of the base, the 0.2 moles per liter, NH3. We're going to multiply it by its volume. 0.1 liters. And we know because of this reaction that for every one mole of NH3, we require one mole of H3O plus. Okay? That's the stoichiometry in front of the reactants. We want to know the concentration required, or the volume required of H3O plus, but we know its concentration. So if we divide by its known concentration of 0.15 moles per liter and multiply all of this out, this is our just dimensional analysis, we'll get 133 milliliters or 0.133 liters. that work? Everyone okay with that? Okay. Okay. 
Now, if we want to find the uh, pH at the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, we know we are only going to have NH4 plus present in solution. And it's going to be in equilibrium um, with NH3 and H3O plus. Because we have equilibrium arrows, we need to use an ice table. And with an ice table, we need to use molarity. So we need to know the molarity of NH4 plus in solution. And this is why it was so important to figure out the volume required of uh, HBr to reach the equivalence point, because we need to know the total volume of the solution. <clears throat> the concentration then of NH4 plus is going to be its moles, 0.02 divided by the total volume, and this is going to be the 0.1 liters of NH3 that we started with, plus the 0.133 uh, HBr that we added. And we'll get 0.0858 moles per liter for NH4+. Plus. Um, then, now we know our concentration, we have a weak base, we could subtract X, we know that, and I'm just sort of skipping to the E line of our ice table. We need a KA value, we have a KB value, so our KA is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10 is equal to x squared over the 0 0.0858 minus x. In this case, x is going to be negligible. We can get rid of that. We can calculate x, which is equivalent to the H3O plus concentration from our ice table. We'll get 6.9 times 10 to the minus 6. And when we take minus the log of that, we'll get 5.16. I know I zoomed through, but uh, we're about out of time. I'll post these slides.